Alice, um, I just want to start again by saying thank you um, for being you and being what you do. And um, for folks here who don't know, um, say a word about the Edible Schoolyard Project um, and how it is that you came to believe that the methods and mindsets and the mindfulness with which you've always um, prepared, served uh, food and created experiences around food in uh, both formal and restaurant settings was something that needed also to be integrated into school and the K-12 education system. Ha what is the schoolyard, Edible Schoolyard Project and how did it come to be? I guess the idea really came to me um, when my daughter was born 33 years ago. And I really worried about what the world was going to be like um, when she grew up. And I remembered I was a Montessori teacher way back when. And uh, I thought, I've always thought that public education is a place where you can reach every child, or most every child in this country. And if you, you know, use that place, if you, uh, in the Montessori idea of winning over students when they were very young, that you could teach a set of values. Uh, at the table and in the garden. So it, the idea was in my mind, and then one of the um, uh, principals of a school in Berkeley called me up because I was complaining about the way the, the middle school looked. It was all run down and graffiti on the walls, and he thought maybe I could come and beautify the school. And I did go over to meet him. And we walked around, and there was lots of space. It was a school that had 1,000 kids. They spoke 22 different languages at home. And it was a school that was built in 1921 on 17 acres of land, if you can imagine. Most of it had been turned into blacktop, and some had had you know, bungalows on it for additional classrooms. But I just walked around the school with him and all of a sudden the whole idea came to me for edible education. I said, oh, there could be a garden over there and you could teach math and science in the garden and let's build a cafeteria out there and so that every kid could have a free school lunch and then I said, oh, goodness, we could use that bungalow, repair it, and make it into a kitchen classroom. And, and, and I told him all about this, and he said, thanks so much, but I'll call you. <laughs> and then, believe it or not, he called me six months later. He said, I think we're ready. But he said, please, I said, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. And he said, let's begin with the garden. And we'll just keep that idea about free school lunch. You know, that can be in your head and mine. I promise I'm going to do it. But don't scare people by saying free school lunch. And so now, here we are, to almost 22 years later. And I'm not scared at all about saying free school lunch, not just for the kids at King's School, but every, for every kid in this country, every student in this country. It's the beauty and the power of the Edible Schoolyard and this notion of edible education um, is, as you said, not just about free school lunch and not even just about free organic school lunch, and not even just about free organic school lunch, cultivated, prepared, served with the same kind of mindfulness that one has at Chez Panisse, um, that one has in this slow food movement that you've helped to catalyze uh, around the country and the world, uh, but that there's an intention about, well, back to the Montessori sense, an intention to teach democracy in the course of 
creating these kinds of settings. And maybe one way to just make that vivid is tell us what we're doing here, right? What are we doing here besides just eating and serving? Like, what's happening here <laughs> from, a, from a democracy and a Montessori standpoint of learning by doing and using the works and the forms uh, to, to teach things? Well, I probably would have burned more rosemary in this room if I could have without setting off the fire alarms. But I really want people to sense the food, um, not just at the mouth and the nose, but really to hear the good sounds, to be able to see the beauty of the table and uh, to touch things, that these are our pathways into our minds. And uh, we need to really educate those pathways. That's what she always felt. But this is, the lunchroom can be the place of social justice, of democracy. And today, uh, I'm pretending that you're middle school students <laughs> and um, uh, you're behaving very civilized for <laughs> middle school students, I have to say. But the idea is that this is an academic subject. This is a history of the Silk Road and you're getting credit for eating it. And you're digesting what's on that placemat in a way that I think you're really going to remember it. You see the pictures, you see the food that was traded. You're maybe having that conversation at the table. And maybe it's facilitated and maybe it's not. But unless we make food and agriculture part, uh, I mean, uh, the major part of a curriculum. Uh, and we have these everyday values. And we were talking, I know you've been talking all the time about how we teach these slow food values when we live in a fast food culture. And one great way is to pass the food around the table. And we teach generosity. We're thinking about how much we have in that bowl and how we have to share it. We're saying, please, and thank you. And uh, we're depending on each other. And once you realize that this food is really supporting directly the people who are taking care of the land. And I wanted, I wish I had the statistics right now how much food we bought from the organic Seattle community so that you would know that, that we were paying the right price for it and that we were giving that money directly. And that's an idea very, very important to me because taking care of the land is number one. And so if you could imagine school supported agriculture, like community-supported agriculture, we could change farming overnight. Well, you're, the Edible Schoolyard Project has reached into uh, thousands of schools uh, all around the United States uh, and influenced and shaped uh, educators all around the world. And one of the things that's such an obvious uh, analog uh, between, these, uh, between slow food and slow food values is a notion of slow democracy and slow democracy values, right? And almost everything you were describing about how um, you wish us to be experiencing this and each other right now, to see each other around this table, to pass food with civility, to express generosity, to be mindful and conscious of where the food came from. Um, these are essentially the same kinds of skills that once we break for lunch and go back out into the world are wholly, not partially and directly, not metaphorically, um, transferable to how we move in democracy, right? How we move as citizens in civic life. Um, and one of the things that, Alice, I'm, I'm, I'm so struck by, I mean, um, we've been talking over since last night and today um, uh, at different points, either about uh, the, the ways in which joy and pain are universal, universal entryways for empathy or understanding. Uh, ways in which wounds and reckoning, uh, but also surprises of possibility, um, are ways to rehumanize each other. 
and all those themes become very vivid and tangible at the table here. And what is it going to take even beyond the work that you're doing in schools for those of us who are somewhat older than middle school now, right, um, to begin to change norms and values uh, that food itself is perhaps the greatest gateway um, to a revitalization of uh, a civic sensibility and perhaps the greatest gateway into rehumanizing each other uh, in our politics. I absolutely agree. It comes through taste. If it tastes really good, people wake up in a way that is sort of exceptional. And, and it's, it, it, the food, it, when it's alive like that, and it's so beautiful. I mean, I just look at this. I, I know where I am in time and place. I know what season it is. It's bringing people back to their, their senses. And I'm, I'm just um, convinced that, that having gatherings in people's homes, cooking together, whenever I'm cooking with friends, I go and buy the food, but they all know they're gonna cook together. We're all gonna cook together. And it may be in school, and this is something terribly important to me, that those placemats could be anything. It could be that we're doing a language class and we're studying Spanish and we're eating a tortilla soup and we're eating a jicama salad and we're into the culture of the food of Mexico and we're learning how to use chopsticks when we're studying Japan. And it, it's endless, the way that we can go into botany uh, with all of the local trees and, and, and have them all identified on the, on the placemat for little young children to identify and remember. But it's, it's an everyday thing that we do. All of us, if we're lucky, get to do this. And we choose what we're going to eat for breakfast and lunch and dinner. And we, every time we make a choice, it's a choice to support the people who are doing the right thing, or it's not. Well, this is the final question I want to pose to you, um, because the key phrase you just used is, if we're lucky, right? And the spirit of this work that you're doing with the Edible Schoolyard um, is so that not only those who have certain forms of material fortune uh, get to experience slow food and slow democracy, but that these things are for all, right? And that you are trying to democratize this experience, a Chez Panisse experience, um, in a way that isn't just about, that isn't at all about watering it down, but is quite about revealing to everybody the democracy of beauty, the democracy of taste, the democracy of sense, Right? the democracy of human fellow feeling, um, and that the democracy of food now takes you into a different realm, which is the non-democracy of markets and the non-democracy of the ways in which resource and power get allocated and the non-democracy of who decides um, what land shall be stewarded how or not. Right? Um, and so I want to ask you just in some closing thoughts about um, this kind of driving spirit that you have to make this experience that began as something very special and rarefied as something that is meant to be for all, that this is food for all, justice for all, equality for all, and experience for all. I think you really summed it up there. <laughs> but it really is about, not just about school lunch, I'm talking about breakfast, lunch and an afternoon snack, all free for all students. So I'm just thinking that, that, that this could be a very delicious revolution. <laughs> this is not hard to do. This is not about studying, really reading a book. It's not about that. It's about touching people in a place where they really are, are, are really changed. And maybe I have to tell you a story, and forgive me if I've 
I've told you before. Uh, it's a very short story, but I think you'll understand what I'm really talking about. And it's a woman in San Francisco who had a project in the San Francisco County Jail called Catherine Sneed. And she called me up and she said she had a, uh, a garden project at the prison. And she wanted to know whether I would buy the produce from the jail. And I said, well, I'd be happy to buy it if you grow it to our specifications. And she said, well, you have to come to the jail. And I said, no, I, I don't want to come to the jail. Just send us the produce. She said, you must. You must meet my student gardeners. So I went. And um, they had seven acres of land. And there were about 25 guys that were there around the table. And she said, tell Alice what, what you're doing. And one kid, about 20, raised his hand. He said, I shouldn't be saying anything. Uh, it's my first day in the garden. He said, this is the best day of my life. OK? So I understood that growing food, and they were offering the food to the homeless centers in San Francisco, that this could be a transformational experience. And so I said, if you can do it in a jail, you can do it in a school. The very last thing, Alice, um, I want you to give us direction um, I know you are working in the state of California to make edible education um, even more officially widespread and part of the curriculum. But what can people here, whatever state in the union they're from or whatever, whether they're from other countries here, um, what would you call on us to do to carry the principles and the practice of edible education, uh, what I think of as civics by tasty means, um, uh, to the places where we live? Well, I went to a wonderful elementary school yesterday, and I was so impressed with what they were doing and the possibility and their interest in really bringing back um, cooking in schools again, doing the real, what we're talking about today. And I said, you know, if you pull the parents together and the people in the school district, Absolutely, we'll all come and help you make this happen. But you, it, it's, it's a, collabor a real collaboration with the farmers. The organic farmers have to be with us. The teachers need to be with us. You know, the politicians, yes, they need to be with us. But it's something that's kind of as right as rain, that everybody cares about schools, I think that we still do, don't we? Um, it makes me think we don't. Um, and I'm, I'm very worried about that. And I hope to be able to talk about that at the breakout session. Because we, we really live in a fast food culture. And we have digested the values of fast, cheap, and easy. Many, many other values. And it, it, we're pushing up against that. And even the most enlightened people think food should be cheap. Well, I want to um, please join me in thanking Alice Waters, not only for this conversation, but for this meal. Thank you, Alice.